Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos over philosophers not ordinarily thought of as philosophers by moving on today to a discussion of the philosophy of Tarl Warwick, otherwise known as the prolific vlogger Styx. Now, we're going to go all the way back in this video to 2016, specifically like um, October 2016, I think is when this book was first released, uh, shortly before the election of that year. And this is um, his classic occult memetics reality manipulation. Now, I would totally recommend you to actually go out and get a copy of this text, which at least on Kindle can be gotten for extremely cheap and um, actually read the whole thing yourself. It's quite entertaining and informative. So in this video, I'm not really going to say synopsize the whole book so much as I'm going to um, call to your attention certain things about this, which maybe could be dealt with on a more, say properly, a or explicitly philosophical level. And of course, that is kind of the point of this channel is to um, bring that sort of dialogue to fruition, which might otherwise go unacknowledged. So I'll begin with the disclaimer that this video is, of course, for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor refute any theories contained within the book under discussion, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. This video presents the ideas of Tarl Warwick in an objective third-party manner. It does not offer any advice whatsoever, but is solely concerned with philosophy. So Warwick opens the text by knowing that to the extent that so taboo a subject as occult memetics is allowed to be discussed within the mainstream at all, which is, of course, not very much, it is only for the purpose of it dismissing it as nothing more than mere superstition. This is something we have progressed beyond on a historical level, and something which, by the way, does not contain any possibility to have truth value anyway. Warwick questions, however, why, whether there might instead be some need to understand memetics, maybe from a secular perspective as a certain technology which can indeed disseminate linguistic information on a mass scale in a way that really works despite the fact that you may not have an ability to fully explain why, but also pneumatically, that is to say you can also understand occult memetics as a certain hermeneutical horizon in which real spiritual phenomena can actually be disclosed in a medium open to interpretation from a human subject is kind of the terminology I would use from my own philosophy to explain this. He says himself, while memetics is a topic of secular interest and one of great value in understanding human systems, especially language and propaganda, it should be overlapped with the spiritual. The idea that occult knowledge of memetics is indeed a legitimate field of knowledge, despite lacking as yet the same type of epistemological criteria as the so-called hard sciences, is not so controversial, really, when one realizes that alchemy also predated chemistry in much the same way, but for this very reason, open up a valuable window to discover insights that were later validated by scientific means, but were already known with a certain level of certainty before then. For this reason, Warwick even goes as far as to boldly define magic as science not yet quantified and accepted by the reigning modern ethos of a given society in a given time period. It might also be defined loosely as cause and effect by means which are not culturally acceptable, especially within whatever scientific community exists in a given era and place. In Julius Evola's own work on the Hermetic tradition, you might be reminded, he noted that the stereotype that alchemy was just primitive chemistry was actually largely an intentional obfuscation of its spiritual content on the part of its own practitioners. In an era in which church persecution for any alternative spiritualities was enough of a threat in itself to require such a veil excluding outsiders from the discipline. Warwick himself, however, makes an exception to this general rule by offering to actually pull back the veil and speak in plain terms to the general public about a field which was indeed gaining momentum and cultural significance in the year 2016 when this text was written. 
Let's begin, though, by establishing that the occult is really real. By this, Warwick does not mean, of course, all of the silly stereotypes of Harry Potter, like the flying broomsticks and other manipulations of physical matter fashionable in Hollywood films, which are actually, as John Michael Greer repeatedly noted, working instances of technology rather than magic. Rather, he means a certain proto-scientific study of truths, which the methodology of science has not yet caught up with being able to explain or describe. For example, let's consider what the occult has to say about the concept of information transference. Well, one doesn't even need a very sophisticated psychological modeling apparatus to realize that the mere act of speaking to another person is an actualization of just such information transference in which a linguistic description spoken by one person will indeed generate a visualization of the content in the second person's mind. It must be emphasized, however, that this is not a matter of simply retrieving a carbon copy of some specific figure which had already been seen by person number two, for we can somehow imagine things which we either have not personally or ex experienced, or which perhaps do not even exist, and we do this through synthesizing content stored in various locations within the archive of memory. In fact, even psychologists have proven that most of what we think is remembering objective events is actually a creative synthesis drawing from many different sources. Although the result of this process is only half true, the process itself will still seem so subjectively convincing to the person performing it that he or she will insist that the creative synthesis is to be preferred over the event as it really happened. What had not been sufficiently studied before 2016, though, was the potential for this combined power of information transference and creative synthesis to be used for properly political purposes. The word for this, of course, is occult mimetics. What is the stimulus for such information transference to function on a mass scale except, of course, the meme? What is a meme, though? Well, Richard Dawkins kind of coined this basically by transliterating the ancient Greek word for imitation in order to describe a unit representative of a small portion of human culture which can spread and mutate and drive cultural evolution in a way eerily similar to what you would find within the biological realm. Well, in the era of technological modernity, we simply take for granted that a meme must take the form of being a humorous image which can go viral through the wonders of the internet, to use Warwick's own phrase, but occult mimetics allows you to instead understand how the apparatus of information transference can work with the goal of causing a reflective change within the consciousness of the victim of infection, often in order to bring about mass-scale changes of a properly political variety. There's nothing too new about this idea, though, for the environment we inhabit is itself always the result of so much mimetic manipulation, even from the vastly distant past, often incorporating sources who have long since been quite literally dead, but somehow continue to exert a lingering influence, which conditions what we see before we even see it. Nor is this conditioning necessarily a bad thing, for the emergence of the world of meaning constantly requires our own hermeneutical prejudices to fill in the gaps in order to allow it to appear just as it does. Gadamer, of course, warned that removing those prejudices will not allow the thing in itself to appear exactly as it really is in some untainted and objective form. Rather, removing those prejudices will stop it from appearing at all. Likewise, we miss the point if we think that memetics is simply the study of viral images with subtitled text which appear within some social media newsfeed. For the mimetic manipulation of hermeneutics is arguably the most effective precisely when it is the most imperceptibly carried out. The most effective memes, in other words, are the ones which you have no idea are memes.
Lest the reader be skeptical of this claim, one might be reminded that within the realm of cinema, for example, much of the manipulation of consciousness through information transference is actually not going on at the level of visual imagery. It's rather the soundtrack, which is arguably far more crucial. One film score composer who was interviewed on television in 2009 actually went as far as to dare the audience to try to watch some horror film, but with the music completely removed. Well, the result of that would just be a total joke, which would not be scary at all. Most people don't know that much of what carries you into a state of fright is just the sound itself. In other words, ideas can indeed be transferred, not only without any visual imagery, but even without linguistic speech. Even chimpanzees, one may be reminded, practice information transference, but they do so through gestures, and in the pre-literate societies, symbols such as the basic image of the thing which was for sale at a given place, um, communicated as much as words do within literate societies. What happens, though, if one goes beyond information transference on a single meme level? Can one even succeed in manipulating the entire worldview of a given person? Such a totalizing effect as changing a person's entire worldview really does make sense when you keep in mind that magic not only manufactures viral ideas, but it also implements ever finer and ever more efficient techniques to manipulate the rate and scope of their spread among other hosts. These are goals and characteristics, though, which are not terribly different from those of any biological life form. In fact, another trait which they share with biological life is that the idea will mature over time, spawning offspring of its own, which go even beyond anything which the original makers could have imagined themselves. Let us make one thing clear, though. The technological infrastructure of the internet is not strictly required for meaning to take place, for as soon as you have the possibility of communication between two beings, meaning already basically becomes not only possible, but even inevitable. That being said, if a given technological change is massive enough, it still can launch a whole new era in the history of meaning, in which certain things are rendered possible that would have been either far more difficult or strictly impossible in the previous phase. For this reason, Warwick proposes that the history of meme technology be divided up into the following phases. First, with the dawn of written language at about 3000 BC, suddenly you find that an idea can quite literally outlive its author. We're still reading, in fact, um, today, the thoughts of people who've been dead for thousands of years. In the second phase, he notes that um, the first attempt at mass literacy education in about 859 AD was basically a response to the properly technical problem that any given text is only as effective as, as it is accessible by a reader, yet the number of the latter could only grow in line with implementing certain mass education programs to take what was before um, a privilege restricted to a tiny cast of, say, scholars, priests, etc., and instead make it ever more democratically accessible. In the third phase, Warwick notes that the invention of the printing press in the 1440s um, increased the number of texts that could be produced in a shorter amount of time, but it also preserved the original intent of the author much more effectively than the older technologies of copying manuscripts had. Bart Ehrman, for example, has written an enormous amount on all of the alterations among New Testament manuscripts, which number at least 300,000, i.e. even conservative counts. Well, this state of affairs only makes sense when you consider that a living scribe who would copy these manuscripts um, literally word for word <laughs> in the ancient era um, would have his own hermeneutical prejudices over what the text was supposed to say, and Ehrman argues would sometimes slightly alter uh, the manuscript in order to make it less usable by people that that person considered to be heretics, whose religious views, one might be reminded, might not have even existed at the time that the text was originally written, but as the centuries progressed, we had to make sure that this couldn't be used by separationists, adoptionists, Gnostics, etc. Finally, in the uh, fourth phase, Warwick links together the invention of the telegraph, the radio, the television, and the first public website as each progressively placing greater emphasis on the machine itself than on the social effects as arguably the first three did. These are still ultimately significant, though, for their effects on the manipulation of consciousness, which will only be recognized if magic is emphasized. 
over any purely materialistic analysis. It's quite interesting, though, that Warwick actually listed the rise of modern social media in, say, 2006 as the eighth major phase in this history, rather than just include it under the generic phase of public websites, which were already available by the early 1990s and which made up an earlier phase. He justified this by arguing that social media seemed, well, at least in the year 2016 when this text was written, to offer up greater potential for any given individual to spread ideas over massive scopes at almost instantaneous rates, since the technology itself seemed to be hardwired to favor a decentralized model in which any random person with a device in their hand could at least participate in the competition to produce an idea that could theoretically win the race to infect the most minds in the whole wide world. In this sense, he praised social media as the most democratic of all the technologies of mass memeing because not everyone owns their own cable TV company, for sure. But just about everyone in 2016 had their own social media profile, or actually many of them. Of course, if you followed his YouTube channel and BitChute channel and all the other platforms he's on now, by 2020, Warwick became far more skeptical of at least the mainstream social media platforms, which had tried frantically to implement technical fixes to inhibit the same democratization of mass communication which he had praised earlier. These were restrictions which were, of course, unequally distributed and only for partisan political purposes, but Warwick himself responded by just promoting alternative platforms like BitChute, etc., which he claims will salvage the same general technological benefit, but without the unnecessary politicization and BS coming from uh, the uh, culture of uh, San Francisco, etc., favoring instead openly platforms that are based in other nations like, say, Russia and France and England, etc., Though, of course, only time will tell how things actually work out in the trajectory of modern technology itself. At any rate, one might very well object that the definition of memeing overlaps so much with the general term communication that there's really no need to even bother with employing the former. Yet Warwick correctly observes that the nature of memeing opens up a window of opportunity in which some new technological phase can take advantage of its newfound abilities to allow one to contemplate memes dealing with subject matter that would have before seemed too objectionable to even be allowed a place within the competition or discussion. Often, the newer phase uses humor to get one to pay attention to things otherwise considered far too taboo to even begin to think about. Too few had considered, especially before 2016, how this coincidental overlapping of factors, that is to say new technology, humor, forbidden subject matter, viral infection of minds, mass participation, democratization, and decentralization, might serve properly political purposes, but of course that is the theme of the remainder of this book. Warwick notes that this claim should not seem quite so controversial, for any government by default requires some sort of technological apparatus to manipulate the consciousness of its population in order to induce them to favor certain ideologies while repudiating others without really understanding the reasons why. Warwick note that any state which failed to do that, by the way, would be doomed for collapse in the long term. Just consider John Michael Greer's claim that the um, Soviet Union did not collapse for strictly technical or even economic reasons, as we usually say, but rather because by the 1980s it had become painfully clear to just about everyone there that the communist utopia which they had been promised for decades was never really going to arrive. Well, Greer repeatedly noted that the religion of progress has fallen on similarly hard times in the United States and the West in general, and that's exactly why Elon Musk continues to shout into the media megaphone as loud as he possibly can that we're really going to Mars this time, I promise you, just because pretty much everyone knows that we're really not.
In addition, whereas before the elites were genuinely admired by the working masses because they all shared more or less the same values, now the gap between the two has grown so wide that the elites have turned to forcing through technological fixes to simply coerce the ignorant masses to do exactly as they're told, and they no longer even try to hide their co uh, contempt and disdain for the human garbage lying so far below them. Just tune into CNN to see this clue Foolishness and snobbery on a daily basis put on display for all to see. This need to coerce, though, is simply a sign of a much deeper failure to win hearts, of course, through mimetic means. Warwick provides a very interesting explanation for this failure. He notes that the elites have really been slightly outflanked by the rapid rise of decentralized communication itself. For this reason, the age-old formula that whichever candidate raises the most money by default wins the election had already begun to crumble in 2016 when funding alone really was not any longer enough to guarantee victory in a competition in which online memes had to be produced in a more convincing and often more humorous form to win the game of infecting more minds than the other side could. To say that Hillary Clinton, or rather her paid minions, had failed miserably at that task is quite the understatement. Warwick claimed that regime's response to this was to instead disseminate their propaganda through channels which seem to the naked eye to be composed of ordinary folks who really believe their own BS, but oftentimes there's quite literally nobody home, for state-run troll farms are a necessary tool for any functional regime today, in which you provide the illusion that even the most despised figures in the world have millions of committed and loving followers. Warwick noted, however, that even this uh, seemingly massive technological advantage, that is to say, the millions of sock puppets repeating the same message which just happens to further the interests of the wealthy elites running the uh, corporations and uh, world government apparatuses is still largely ineffective though because a technological advantage of that kind on a purely numeric level does not automatically translate over into a magical advantage. Perhaps surprisingly though, Warwick encourages anyone wishing to gain such a competitive advantage by honest means to study logic. As he notes that basically any college-level textbook over the subject will do, proving that the system is actually failing due to intellectual incompetence rather than for any mystical ineffable cause, as even the academic industry itself has basically given up on a task so basic as really thinking, simply because it's so much easier to milk the latest trends of the SJW movement to unearn economic prosperity while pretending to be committed to ending all economic economic inequalities. Warwick mentions another all-too-logical fact about the methodology of memeing. An idea which is too obviously occultic in nature will only be spread by occultists, which are a tiny minority of the population, while everyone else will basically ignore that content, or reject it, or find it inaccessible anyway. The most viral memes, therefore, are the ones that actually do not seem to the naked eye to have any occult meaning at all, and whose occult meanings will be all the more successful for that same paradoxical reason. Contrary to expectation, even the system itself knows this and creates the illusion that ordinary folks just happen to be parroting exactly the same talking points which boost some corporate stock value. By the time it is revealed later that ordinary these ordinary folks in question don't actually exist, and it was all really just a gimmick gen generated by some corporation's marketing department, it's already far too late. The damage had been done as the virus had spread through the population before anyone noticed what it really was. This is not at all to say, however, that people are totally passive in their reception of memes, for one does indeed have a certain agency to react to a given meme with the desire to destroy it, of course, on properly mimetic grounds. Anti-memes, he reminds us, consist of intentional alterations of some original meme which ironically succeed in negating its purpose and effects within its own medium by distorting its message into its exact opposite. But wait, is all this really just a competition between abstract messages? Or is there some deeper force at work in the midst of all of this struggle? Remember Warwick's warning at the very beginning that 
that this stuff is really real. As he says himself, an egregore is a thought form collectively willed into some semblance of action up to and including semi-sentience, and of course, anyone who finds this idea laughable should find it even more funny that we had reached the point in 2016 at which a presidential candidate had found it necessary to, in essence, declare war on a cartoon frog, as the more abashed public may term it. Little do they realize that this in innocuous frog had indeed become an egregore of unimaginable force. This idea that this stuff is really real was also confirmed, arguably, in the concept of synchronicity. This is an interesting concept, really, he says, as it describes the convergence of events and concepts that appear to define rational explanation as coincidence and therefore indicate the workings of some deeper autonomous force behind the scenes. For example, was it really a coincidence that the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph of a memer seated at a computer with a DNA strand emerging from it, a depiction which emerged some millennia before such a thing could have been empirically observed in the year 2016, just happened to be associated with a frog deity which overlapped with another cartoon frog that had condensed the idea of smugness into a single unit of communication, which was quite literally indivisible or incapable of being broken down further into any more essential meme. Enter an obscure 1980s record called Shady Lay, fe featuring an image of a frog waving a magic wand on the record's cover, sung by a long forgotten Italian singer who just happened to be named, wait a minute, you gotta be kidding me, Pepe. As if that wasn't enough, the song itself was 5 minutes and 55 seconds. The classic repeating digits which represent stages between segments of chaos and translation of the original song itself just happened to be about the theme of freedom. Warwick ends with a set of very useful tactics, but for those of you who have not read the book itself, you have to actually do so to find 